Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 1988 cult classic, Hairspray. A comedy by John Waters. Uh, I would say it's more of a dance movie or a throwback picture than a straight up comedy. There are some comedic elements in it, There's there are some moments where it'll make you chuckle or make you laugh, but for the most part, it's more of a dance movie. Um, not necessarily a musical, more of a dance film. Now, normally I don't review these kinds of films on my channel, but I, I wanted to give this another watch because I remember enjoying this uh, when I saw it for the first time on TV when I was a kid. I don't remember what channel it was or what network. I don't remember any of that for sure, but I do remember liking it. So I found the DVD at a thrift store. It was like a couple bucks. And watched it recently and I had a good time with it. I would say that out of the two Hairspray films, this is my personal favorite. I know there's two. There's a 2007 film which is based on the 2002 Broadway show. Uh, it features a lot of the same elements from the Broadway show which was in itself an adaptation of this film. And the Broadway show and the movie it just lacks that grit. It lacks that edge that this one has. It lacks that subversiveness, that uh, sleaziness. It, it, it It's too sanitized for my tastes. I, I don't hate it. I don't think it's terrible. Uh, I thought it was okay. There are elements to it that are good. Uh, but... Overall, I prefer this one. I prefer the original. I prefer the 1988 film by uh, John Waters. Now, John Waters directed this and he also wrote it. It's a departure from a lot of his work at the time. Uh, before this, he was known for just doing a lot of crass, offensive, X-rated movies. And he wasn't really known as a guy who could even remotely do well with this type of movie. So he took a risk here by dipping his toe into the more sanitized, chlorine-filled uh, side of the pool versus the one that's just all messy and dirty. And that's what he was known for, was the messy and dirty films. And so this was something that was definitely a departure. But it was something he was passionate about because he grew up in Baltimore and... Uh, he always was a fan of this 60s aesthetic and the 60s era. Uh, so this was a labor of love for John, and it shows. Uh, he, he wrote the film as well as directed it. And for a budget of about $2 million, he got a lot out of it. It doesn't look like a big budget production like the 2007 film does, but only had $2 million to work with. And I felt what he d had... He did well with. Uh, two million is still a good amount of money for John Waters. A lot of the films that he did in the past, they they were even cheaper in some ways than this. So, for him, this was like a big budget, almost. And I would say, out of the films that I've seen from him, I would say that this is my second favorite. My favorite is Serial Mom, and this would be my second favorite uh, I, I haven't seen Pink Flamingos. I've heard of it. I've heard of Female Trouble. I haven't seen those yet, so I can't really say much about them. But from what I've seen from John Waters, uh, which is very little, I know of him, though, and I know of his repertoire, and I know what he was known for. I've seen clips from the other films like Pink Flamingos and, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm definitely familiar with what he was well known for before Hairspray. Now... Hairspray stars Ricky Lake as Tracy Turnblad, this plump, optimistic teenager who hopes to be a star on a TV show called The Corny Collins Show, which was a dance show that was heavily inspired by an actual show uh, that actually uh, aired in real life called The Buddy Dean Show. It was a local dance party program on... But in, that, that aired in Baltimore that preempted American Bandstand. And Waters uh, apparently wrote about that show in his 1983 book, Crackpot, The Obsessions of John Waters. So he was al already a fan of this 
concept and this particular idea long before he decided to write the film. This was uh, Divine's final film uh, because uh, Divine ends up uh, playing Edna, plays uh, Edna Turnblad, Tracy's uh, plus size mother who's ashamed of her obesity, who is uh, definitely more rough around the edges and um, and a uh, lot less optimistic than uh, Tracy. Ricky Lake, I, I felt, just going back to Ricky Lake real quick, I felt she did a really great job playing this role of Tracy. She had the perfect amount of optimism, spunk. She had some uh, nice charisma. Uh, you rooted for her. You wanted her to uh, make the best of her life. Uh, and it was also really different to see a plump-sized gal in a lead role in a film like this, even back then. Uh, it's different nowadays, and it was definitely different back then, that's for sure. You rarely ever saw that. That, And um, Ricky Lake apparently had to work extra hard to keep her plump figure because she all the dancing she was doing, she was losing weight like crazy. And so she just had to just keep stuffing her face full of food in order to remain plump, uh, perfectly plump for the role. Divine, this is one of his best roles. Uh, there's a reason why a lot of people consider it to be one of his best roles, if not his best in terms of acting. He seamlessly transitions here into this overweight housewife. Uh, Divine was known for playing larger-than-life uh, female characters on film, and, and this is a character that's larger-than-life, but in, in a more subdued way, and it really showed his acting chops and, and his abilities, and it's really too bad what happened uh, soon after he finished this film. Uh, he passed away. He actually passed away uh, on... Uh, on a uh, tour. He was uh, going on tour to promote the film with John Waters, and he passed away on the road. Uh, he just, well, I guess the, he was not in that great of health, and he passed away on the road, and John Waters is devastated, understandably so, because Divine was, was a wonderful person and a guy that was there with him from the beginning, and uh, they, he was really good friends with John, and he John was really upset that Divine wasn't able to enjoy his success because this was the first time that Divine had a a role in a film where he was actually critically acclaimed by the mainstream, and and critics were actually praising him, and and the film was actually doing de you know doing decent with its screenings and so on and so forth and and john just was bummed that divine wasn't able to experience that divine is definitely the quintessential edna turnblad i i know that harvey first firestein he played edna in the stage show uh he did fine too but when i think of edna turnblad i think of divine john travolta was just weird i don't know what that was about uh, he had this accent that wasn't even, uh, I don't even know what that was. Was it Baltimore? Was it Southern? Was it, I don't know what it is. It just came across as a caricature of a woman more than a genuine performance. Uh, Divine was so good at playing a woman that you couldn't even tell that it was a man. So that, that, that is, that, that is a testament to Divine's talents. Uh, he also played uh, the rival TV station owner, uh, owner uh, Arvin Hodgepile. So he played one of the villains in the in the film as well. Deborah Harry, Blondie, she plays Velma von Tussel. Uh, she plays this bitchy mom of of the of another bitch, pretty much, uh, because uh, her daughter is Amber, who is this spoiled little rich bitch, uh, and uh, she's a snob, total snob, just like her mom. And uh, it, was, it was fun to see Deborah Harry in this uh, with big hair and just just being all crazy. Deborah Harry is a very uh, talented actress. She's not only a great musician, but she's also a good actress. It's it's honestly kind of too bad she didn't really get a chance to really do a whole lot acting wise. Like she had a few roles here and there. I know she was in Touch in the Dark Side of the Movie and the Wraparound segment. She was in a few other films, but it's she was in Videodrome, 
But it's like she just wasn't really able to really turn that into like a really big acting career. Like she had a few things here and there, but um, she's definitely more more known as as a uh, singer. She's gotten roles before and been on TV, but nothing like a, nothing big, you know, no, not like really big roles, like some sub some little roles here and there, but nothing that's a starring role, so to speak. Uh, Sonny Bono is also in this as her husband, uh, Franklin Von Tussle. Sonny Bono plays this, this perfect, uh, role here of this just ass kissing guy who kisses his wife's ass and everybody else's ass. And he's also an ass. Uh, he's also a racist ass. Uh, Jerry Stiller's in this as Wilbur Turnblad, Tracy's, uh, funny, uh, father, He's fine. He just plays the same role he always plays in everything. The same role he played in Seinfeld as George's dad. The same role he played as the camp counselor in Heavyweights. Uh, Jerry Stiller, you want a, a dad who's funny and, and doesn't take himself too seriously, you get Jerry Stiller. Leslie Ann Powers is also, she's a part of the cast as Penelope uh, Penny Pingleton, Tracy's best friend. Leslie Ann Powers, it seems like she did not really do a whole lot after this. In fact, she did nothing else after this. It's too bad. I, I thought she was really good. Uh, I could see why Amanda Bynes was cast as this, as this role in the 2007 film, because they have a very similar uh, vibe and, and feel when it comes to their performance. Uh, I, I thought Leslie Ann Powers did a really good job. Uh, so it's it's interesting that she never acted again after this. She just retired she did hairspray, and that was it. Uh, I wonder what. I wonder why. I wonder what was behind that. Colleen Fitzpatrick, uh, who's also known as Vitamin C, who sung on soundtracks for a bunch of different movies. She plays Amber. She plays a a, a really nice snobby little uh, bitch. Uh, Michael Saint Gerard is also in this as Lincoln Link Larkin, a teenage heartthrob. Uh, looking like a young Elvis, which he actually, I think he did play a young Elvis in a Elvis TV series, if I remember correctly. Uh, there was an Elvis TV series. Yeah, it was in two, two movies where he portrayed Elvis Presley. He, it was Elvis Presley, Heart of Dixie, and Great Balls of Fire. He was also, uh, in, he played Elvis in an episode of Quantum Leap. So, yeah, and he was on the 20 episode miniseries in ABC, Elvis. Yeah, he was known for playing Elvis. But, uh, Michael St. Gerard, he also, um, I, I thought he played, I thought he was play. I thought he played Superboy, because I thought, I thought he was Superboy, like, that's what, I, I thought he was Superboy, I could be wrong, um, maybe that's a different, that's probably a different actor, because I thought it was Superboy, but Michael St. Gerard, he, he's been a lot of different stuff, yeah, that was a different actor, that was, uh, Gerard Christopher. So, but he played Elvis. You can see why he's a spitting image of Elvis. He was also in Into the Sun, a, uh, a film uh, with uh, Michael Perret and Anthony Michael Hall. And, uh, but he's, he's most known for playing Elvis and uh, for playing Link Larkin in uh, Hairspray. Clayton Prince is, is, uh, is also in this as Seaweed J. Stubbs. Um, Motormouth Maybell's son and Penny's main love interest. Ruth Brown, she's in this, says Motormouth Maybell Stubbs. Sean Thompson plays Corny Collins, the host of the Corny Collins show. Uh, John Waters also has a cameo as Dr. Fredrickson, this uh, really uh, crazy quack, quack uh, crackpot uh, psychiatrist who's trying to brainwash uh, Penny into da only dating white boys. That's the kind of thing that John Waters brings to this type of movie. See, this is a, a film that, on the surface, seems like harmless dance comedy, but but John Waters brings in some seediness to it, and some kitsch, and some camp, and some subversive shit to it, and that that would also is is something that really makes it stand out among among the other versions of uh, the story. Uh, I, I I thought it was really. A sweet and charming, trashy love story in a lot of ways. It's nice to. Uh, it was a. Uh, it was John Waters's trashy uh, 
look at the dance crazes of the 60s. And uh, you even had a, a scene where Edna Turnblad is uh, making out with uh, uh, with Link in, in a seedy alley. And there's a rat. And instead of her screaming and everybody's screaming and running away, she's, she's like, it's so romantic. And she just kicks the rat out of the way. Uh, I, I thought that was funny. That was great. That's a, that's such a John Waters touch. Like, I don't I don't think any other director would have been like, yeah, there's going to be a rat there in the alley. And instead of people freaking out and running away like they do in almost every other instance, it's just a nonchalant punt. Just punt the rat and then keep going back to having this romantic moment. Uh, that that was that was a, a really nice touch. Um, there was other actors and actresses. You even had uh, special cameo appearances by Rick Okasek, who is the lead singer of the Cars as a beatnik. You also have Pia Zadora, who plays a beatnik chick. Apparently, John Waters wanted her to have a bigger role. In fact, he wanted her to play Velma. Wanted to play wanted uh, Pia Zadora to play the character of uh, Velva, Velma von Tussle. But she had some uh, scheduling issues, so she wasn't able to do it. So she ended up uh, deciding to uh, still do something for John by playing this bit role of this beatnik. And she shot for a couple days. She looks like a clone of Janine Garofalo in this particular uh, role. When I first saw this role, I thought it was Janine Garofalo. But it, it, it's Pia Zadora. But... She could easily have been a total lookalike for Janine Garofalo in this role as uh, a beatnik chick. So, yeah, the cast, everyone does their jobs equally as well. I can't think of anybody in the cast that's bad. Everybody does a great job. Everybody delivers a good performance. Uh, I would say when it comes to the music... The score, there isn't really a lot of original music score. There's a few notes here and there. But for the most part, it's a bunch of 60s classic dance songs and R&B. So uh, that is the soundtrack for the film. And it, the, the songs are all really good choices. You get Limbo Rock, Let's Twist Again by Chubby Checker, Deo which I guess Pia Sidora sang, Duke of Earl, Train of Nowhere, The Fly, The Bird, Hide and Go Seek, Mashed Potato, uh, Waddle Waddle, You Don't Own Me by Leslie Gore, Life's Too Short, and uh, the uh, main theme, uh, the, the original song, uh, that the only original song for the soundtrack, which was uh, Hairspray by Rachel Sweet, which I really like that song. That's that's my favorite song out of the soundtrack is the is the song that's uh, written specifically for the film. It ties in with the genre of music that was popular at the time. And and it's just a really cute, fun song and very catchy, too, because it's still playing in my head as, as I as I speak. Uh, the music video is a lot of fun, too. I'll probably put it in li uh, a link to the music video in the video description of the uh, for this video because it's a really fun music video, and it's pretty rare, and I don't believe it was ever put on the DVD or the Blu-ray. Cinematography by David Boner. It's not a boner. It really captures the vibrant uh, looks and and garishness of the 60s, of the, the early 60s, the era uh, that this film was taking place in, uh, the editing by Janice Hampton, I thought was also really, uh, excellent. It's, it runs for about 92 minutes and it goes by at a brisk pace. I didn't really feel it was boring. It didn't really slow down. It wasn't really sluggish at any point in time. It's an entertaining movie. When it comes to the script by John Waters, I thought the characters were well-written and the dynamics between them and, uh, the crazy, uh, CD elements were also really well done. Uh, it's um, definitely something. The climax is crazy. I mean, Deborah Harry is hiding a bomb in her giant beehive hairdo, and it explodes, and it's something straight out of a Looney Tune cartoon. And and uh, I like the I, I loved how uh, Edna, uh, not well, Edna is also a, a character that changes over the course of the film, and I loved how she changed. But I loved how uh, Tracy she embraces her bug. Uh, thing you know because uh, Am Amber's trying to make her look bad by by calling her a roach, 
which is based on a deleted scene. Uh, apparently, there were supposed to be roaches that came out of her hair, and uh, that's why uh, Amber says that she's got roaches in her hair because she actually did. But that was a deleted scene. There was a few other deleted scenes. Um, there apparently. Tracy is supposed to require it. She's uh, supposed to start a first ship working in the Hardy Hard Joke Shop. Uh, but she managed to scare away all of her customers. Uh, so then she's excused to go to the hop. Um, that's how she's able to end up going to the Parkville v VFW record hop. That's how they are able to go there instead of do their obligations or, or studies or something or anything like that. Uh, another involves Tracy skipping school. She steals shoes from the Etta Gown shop, breaks into Von Tessel's home. She uses Amber's hair bleach to bleach her hair in Amber's sink, Amber's sink um, which explains the change of her hair color later in the film. I'm glad that was cut out because that just makes the character kind of seem less wholesome, really. I, I, I understand why Waters is trying to muddy the waters a little but you know i'm fine with that not being in the movie uh also apparently there was a final deleted scene uh where where there's a musical number which involved the teens performing an obscure 1960 dance 1960s dance called the stupidity at the auto show just prior to tracy being released from reform school but waters decided it wasn't appropriate uh saying i thought you know you don't want your leading man to look stupid right in the big finale but it's okay if he looks stupid when he gets his knees supposedly broken by a woman swinging a purse, but it's so absurd. It's hilarious though. He's dra He's he's his knees are shot and he's on the ground and he's like crawling and he's yelling for Tracy. He's like, "It's Tracy, Tracy!" <laughs> oh man. Um. Uh. There's a lot of funny stuff in this. Like, I wouldn't say it's like a laugh riot every minute, but there's still a lot of really funny stuff. Like the stuff with uh, with Link and his knees are, are broken and he's he's yelling for Tracy. Um, the uh, sequence where uh, Penny's mom goes into the inner city and just gets freaked out by all the black men. Like she finds out that one of the the police officer is even black and she's like Whoa! she just flips out runs away screaming um there's also a few of the 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 climax with the beehive hairdo and everything that blows up and 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 there's also a few other nice little lines here and there um overall i i i get a kick out of the film it, it's it's a it's campy it's corny just like the show the corny collins show but it's intentionally done that way. It's just small to see uh, camp riots. It, it's, I, I would say it reminds me in tone similar to something like Little Shop of Horrors with a little bit of the seedy dark humor interspersed with uh, some, you know, s over the top uh, schmaltz and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's a... Uh, I don't know if it's underrated because it's a film that has a lot of uh, critical acclaim and it did fairly well when it came out. I mean, it made $8 million on a $2 million budget and was a big hit on home video. Uh, so I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call it underrated or anything, but I, I love uh, John Waters loved, loved uh, this review of Hairspray and I equally love it because uh, David Eldstein, he, he, this is his review of of uh, hairspray in in a, in a, just a few words. Uh, a family movie both the Bradys and Mansons could adore, and I just love that. I think that's a great way to uh, sum it up. It's it, it's got a little bit of that Heather sort of a vibe. Like if you're a fan of Heather's, it's got that sort of sort of uh, uh, counterculture vibe to it, but it also has a uh, light-hearted uh, heartwarming a uh, story as well as uh, a really uh, topical especially for the time discussion about race uh, and about uh, segregation and so on and so forth and um, I feel the film actually does a good job handling that it doesn't come across as heavy-handed I felt the uh, didn't really interrupt the film's tone the quirkiness of the whole movie uh, didn't 
make it less fun. It added some weight to the proceedings, which is much needed, but it, but it didn't it didn't over uh, load it. I, I felt the 2007 film did that at times, and uh, this one didn't do that. But anyway, I don't really know what else to say about Hairspray, um, except if you see the trailer, it looks like fun to you. If you like stuff like Grease or you know musicals or you're a fan of like 60s throwback movies like Shag the movie and other stuff like that um I would definitely recommend it if uh it doesn't seem like it's something that you're into you could skip it because it's probably not something that you're you're going to be a fan of um but I don't know what to say except if I rate it out of five stars the issues I have with it are, are very few, to be honest. I, I, it's just, it's not as funny as it could be. And uh, that's really the only thing I can think of. It's not as funny as it could be. Uh, and, uh, but overall, it's still a really satisfying, fun, entertaining movie. It's, I, I, I don't really know what else to say. And, and I don't really know what else to say in terms of, what I felt needed to be fixed or replaced or improved upon. I, I felt it's really good just the way it is. So if I were, if I were to rate it out of five stars, I give it something like four and a half, four out of five. I enjoyed it that much. I know I seem like a guy who wouldn't be like into hairspray, but I, I enjoyed the film uh, ever since I saw it as a kid on TV and Watching it again, I appreciate even more of the aspects of the film in terms of how they used the budget and how they recreated the look and the feel of this uh, era of the early 60s. And the dancing is all really well choreographed and the characters are fun. And it's just it's just a nice, fun, quirky, uh, surreal 60s uh, camp fest. It's, that's a great way to put it. Um, anyway, thank you for watching. And as always... I will see you later. See ya.